Hey guys, welcome back to Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. I'm still Chris Bircher. This is episode 42, Safety. Safety is one of those things when you when you look at uh, um, our hierarchy of human needs or whatever, you need shelter and food and these things, but somewhere on that list and probably pretty high up that I often forget about is safety. And uh, that's what I want to talk about today in the context of my life and sort of what I think is a basic human need. And if you've noticed, uh, things look a little bit different down here. I'm trying something new, sticking to the 20 minute time slot in a new version of the studio. If you've been checking out my site lately, I've done a couple of curiosity interviews now and I've got two or three in the can and a whole bunch of people lined up. So I'll be releasing those about every two to three weeks, depending, and still pumping out these uh, regular episodes. And uh, we'll see how that goes. And maybe it'll be two different episodes a week. I really don't know. Uh, that's what spontaneity and improvisation is all about. <laughs> we'll play it by ear and um, deal with that uh, as it happens. So let me put this in the context of our human need of safety. So I wanted to call this episode Terabithia, right? And if you've read Bridge of Terabithia or seen the movie, you know what I mean. I use that word to describe um, a state of creativity and sort of not giving a shit about what anyone else thinks. And I've done a little bit of work recently on my old beliefs and sort of, um, I, you know, that, that has revealed some things. And it wasn't any kind of intentional work I'm dealing with um, my past and my present. And something interesting came out. I got in touch with um, myself as a 13-year-old kid. And when I was 13, I lived in Finley, Ohio, in this cool, big old, giant old house that somebody died in that nobody wanted that my parents bought and sort of took care of. Now, I lived in, this is weird, the maid's quarters, which is pretty bizarre, up on the third floor. And it was the whole third floor was a, a small bedroom with a closet, a window, and uh, it was the highest point in the house, and it had its own bathroom and shower. I mean, it was the perfect place for a teenager, right? And uh, when I think back about this, um, which is part of the reason, incidentally, that I made this space, was this was my space. And in remembering it and thinking about it and sort of re-experiencing what that was like and what it meant, this was my creative space, right? This was my safe space. It's where I learned to play guitar. It's where I learned to... Uh, to write. It's where I learned to play video games. It's where I learned to smoke weed and cigarettes. I mean, some, some good, some bad, right? Um, and it was where I could go where I knew nobody would bother me. And maybe it's because I have five kids and a wife and COVID, but I've been seeking this place and I've sort of lost touch with the need for this place. And I have some weird beliefs about that being a childish need and now I'm an adult and I don't need that anymore. So all that to say... I'm experiencing a renaissance of my terabithia, my need for creativity. And, and this is all related to this. And that led me to, you know, why, why did I have that space? And is this different from other people's childhoods? And I think where it's different is I wonder, I don't know for sure, nobody can know for sure, but I think I created this space so skillfully. And, that, and that's part of it. As I look back and I'm like, damn, that's awesome. So this 13-year-old kid made this safe space with all this cool stuff. I had this cool desk. It was the, you know, it was the 80s, but I had a water bed because our house was so damn cold that, you know, it was easier to heat the bed than it was easier than it was to heat the house. So I had a water bed. You know, I had all my stuff, man. I had all everything a kid could po- a person could possibly need, and no one could touch me or bother me there. Uh, and I could let in people I wanted to let in and keep out people I wanted to keep out. Now. What I think is that this was all a reaction, and this is where it differs between whether everybody had a terabithia or, or whether not. Um, and incidentally, I reached out to the author of the book, A Bridge to Terabithia, through her agent, of course, and, and tried to get her on for an interview uh, in the Curiosity series, and I haven't heard anything back yet. I'll keep trying. And I'm not sure that that's a copyrighted noun. or a- Anyway, um, I created this space... And uh, again, I don't know if this is a universal thing and everybody had one or not, but for me, what I realized is this was a reaction, a response to being bullied and feeling out of place. Now, let me put that into some quick context. I was a skinny, tiny kid. Now, granted, and I also, I grew up in South Georgia, so I went to like second to sixth grade in South Georgia where I had friends and it was cool, but that was a a very football-dominated thing and school 
had a huge element of, even at that age, of whether or not you were going to be an athlete. And I obviously was not going to be an athlete by any stretch of the imagination. I was short and tiny and just, I mean, a tiny little kid. And I don't know if I was a late bloomer or, you know, any different. Back then, I probably wasn't a whole lot different from a lot of the kids. But around 11 or 12, you know, as other kids started to get bigger and taller, I certainly didn't. And anyway... And I, and I was ridiculed for that. And I was shy and I was sensitive. And, uh, you know, there were the fighting and the picking on and the name calling. And I, it just didn't agree with me. And I think I, I quickly, uh, it was very obvious that I wasn't going to be an easy target. And so I was, you know, I don't, I don't have any specific memories really of all that. I do have specific memories of a handful of friends and that was cool. And, uh, but I don't have really any specific memories of getting bullied. Now, at 13, between, you know, junior high at the time and middle school or elementary school, I guess they call it middle school now, between sixth and seventh grade, I moved from way south Georgia to northern Ohio. And that's a culture shock for anybody, uh, much less somebody that's 13 and going through, you know, arguably one of the most awkward points in a kid's life. And I also was into things like breakdancing and skateboarding and BMX bicycles and, um, you know, sort of these fringe things and... um you know, that, that there wasn't a whole lot of support for that. And I had moved to another small town that was um, very athletic oriented. And I, again, was a small kid and it, an easy target. And now, because everything that I did, I didn't think to protect myself. I just did what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I wore skull and crossbones and neon green pants and pink shoes and, um, you know, weird hair with the Tony Hawk swoosh in the front and short in the back. All, you know, I, I would let my freak flag fly and I wore my heart in my sleeve and I just didn't know any better. I didn't know that that was going to invite bullies and it, and it did. Um, there was some ass kickings and some name callings and, and a whole lot of stuff that just sort of um, drastically informed me that the world was not a very friendly place. And I, and I was, and the hard part about that is I was embarrassed about it and I couldn't really go to my parents. I tried to go to my parents about it. And I think, you know, my dad tried to do his best. He just sort of said, well, what do you expect? People are going to look at you. I mean, look at you. Um, and, and, and in their defense, they were totally cool with it. You know, they said, look, this is just how the world is. You got to be careful. You got to protect yourself, whatever. And so I quickly realized that I, well, I, I quickly the belief that I was out of place in the world was, um, was pretty strong <laughs> to say the least. And so I think maybe this isn't true. It's a good story that I created this room, this Terabithia as my safe space. You know, I didn't feel safe in the world anymore because I didn't, because of who I was and who I knew that I was very in touch with who I was. And I, and I wasn't willing to make the compromises of, trying to be like everybody else. And I think I went through a little bit of that, but quickly realized that was just dumb or I wasn't going to be able to do it. And so in order to recreate some safety and uh, maybe like a defense mechanism or coping strategy or whatever you want to call it, I made myself a space and, and sort of introverted myself. And, and um, I limited the people who I let in and to know me. And I had a select group of friends that were, uh, I was really tight and I was, you know, not afraid to be myself with that were more like me. And, um, yeah, that, but that, that idea of safety and, and the cool part again, because I didn't feel like I had that safety in the world and I couldn't find it in the world, this young person created it. And what I, I guess I've still, I found as a 48 year old man, I still need that. I still need that safety feeling, and to a large to a large degree, I feel that with my family. I feel it with my parents. I feel it with my siblings. I feel it with my close friends. I feel it with my wife and my kids. You know, I can pretty much be who I want to be, but there's still some leftover element of protecting myself from the world, which unfortunately is making it difficult for me to sort of be my authentic self or whatever, and to sort of feel because I'm I'm still defensive. Uh, I still have to feel this urge to defend myself uh, in certain ways, or at least be leery about whether or not I should um, share. And that can reflect on self-esteem, right? If that becomes too strong of a feeling, you know, on the one hand, it's a, it's a, it's a protective mechanism, and that's cool. And as long as a person is being, is actively sort of monitoring and questioning and saying, 
you know, is this a, a situation where I need to assert myself? Do I need to force my boundaries? Do I need to do all things? Or is this a situation where I need to protect myself and um, I can retreat to my home and feel safe? Which is kind of interesting because I consider myself an introvert. And, and, and again, this isn't about me. This is about me connecting to people that might be like this and, and might get something out of this or might learn something or, or just, you know, feel better about being heard or something like that. Um, I'm, I consider myself to be introverted. I have extroverted tendencies. I play in a band. I like public speaking. Uh, I like sharing. I like being vulnerable. You know, those are not necessarily introverted tendencies, but for the most part, I need to recharge my batteries by being alone versus getting my batteries recharged from being around people. Being around a lot of people exhausts me. Spending the whole weekend with my family exhausts me. You know, it doesn't matter. It's just something about me. And I wonder sometimes if this isn't a result of or the cause of that whole Terabithia thing. Like, was I just naturally, you know, an uh, introverted, sensitive person? And, uh, you know, that sort of strategy or, you know, spending alone time or creating a safe space, is that just something that introverts do? Or did I become introverted mm-hmm. because the world seemed unfriendly? I don't know that it matters, but I just thought, thought it was kind of interesting. The point here is, I think. If you look at the problems in the world and you look at the reasons that people seek personal growth or seek therapy or help or do drugs or or get bad habits or whatever, I think a lot of this is the response to not feeling safe. And that makes me think, okay, so is this a childhood, um, something unique to childhood that we grow out of? Or is this something that persists through our lives? And I, and I very much think, and who knows, you know, more information, change of mind. That's the beauty about being open-minded. But right now, I think a lot of us feel unsafe. I think, um, you know, we feel unsafe in our work environments. We don't know if uh, we can say certain things because we're going to get fired. We, we fear losses of varying kinds, whether that's abandonment from our significant other or um, being shunned by our family, being fired at work, not getting uh, a promotion that we want to get or, um, you know, not getting out of a speeding ticket or getting good service, you know, getting served a beer when you're at the bar. I mean, a lot of these things create this sort of feeling of not belonging or for being unsafe or being in a situation where you may have a disadvantage. Let me think about that. How universal is that? And so I, I think we all, going back to the, the, the hierarchy of needs, have this need for safety. And do we still have that? Are we so influenced by popular culture and what we think we're supposed to need or want or the or um, status quo definitions of masculinity or femininity or uh, anything on the, on the gender spectrum? Or, you know, are we influenced about... Because of social media, internet, information availability about who we think we're supposed to be. I've often said, you know, there's this chief dichotomy in life way up on the, on the, at the top of the list that people wrestle with the person they are and the person they think they're supposed to be. Sometimes this can be good and it can stimulate personal growth. I think I should be more empathetic. I think I should be more sensitive to other people's needs. I think I should be nicer to people. I think I should be more patient. Okay, those are good things. Um, but, you know, I, I think I should be less sensitive. I think I should be more of a bully. I think to be to get ahead at work, I've got to be more assertive and more of an asshole. Um, I've got to step on more people in order to, to move up the corporate ladder you know, there's, there's, there's good reasons and bad reasons. There's good differentials and bad differentials between the person you are and the person that you think you're supposed to be. And I think that's about the source of the supposed to be part. Do you think you're supposed to be a certain way because of what society tells you you're supposed to do? And that can create a hugely unsafe feeling because maybe that's not how you want to be. Um, or are you um, concerned about you know, personal growth issues or becoming a uh, more enlightened person or whatever. And so you're focusing on who you think you should be because that's who you want to be, right? If you look at, you know, don't, don't ever compare yourself to anybody else except a former version of yourself. You know, well, how do you want to change? So that thing, that's a, that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, that dichotomy, that pull, push, pull, that relationship, that cognitive dissonance 
between who you really are, that you know how you really feel about a certain issue. And maybe it's not who you really are, but let's take any given issue and how you feel about that. Maybe it's sexuality and then you're, you're struggling because you uh, have, um, you know, homosexual tendencies and those are desires, but you don't think that's what the world wants you to be, or you can't be because your parents are, you know, that's a sort of a, a classic dilemma in my mind anyway, that one would struggle with. Um, so is it, is it something like that, uh, that makes you, that creates this dissonance that could potentially make you feel unsafe or uneasy or stressed out or anxious or depressed. So what do you do about that? Well, I think if, you know, if we've got a a home base, a neutral zone, uh, some safe space, a person you can talk to, a therapist, um, a family member, a friend, you know, any of these things. And for me, that was more solitary and individual. I needed more than that. I needed more than people, right? I needed something, um, which is interesting. And I just thought about this. Maybe that part of that was nicotine. Maybe part of that was THC. Eventually, maybe part of that was alcohol. Something that I could have that was mine, that made, that reminded me of myself, that I could identify with, that felt good, that made me feel safe. How do we do that as adults? You know, and so one of the ways that I'm trying to do that is partially by creating my own space. I can retreat to this space, and it's still annoying because I can hear dogs upstairs, and I can hear people in the bathroom, and I hear things going on, and it's hard not to be distracted. But I have a space that I can escape to, and I'm trying to define it kind of like the 13-year-old kid would have done with all the cool shit that I want to do around. I got mandolins and guitars over here. You know, I can listen to music. Not that I actually do any of this stuff yet because I don't really... I haven't been able to find the time, but it's here. Just the making of the space made me feel better. I know, it's like I always say, I quit smoking weed for the most part a long time ago, but I would still kind of keep my gear around. Or like when I when I smoke cigarettes, I like to have my lighter. You know, I had these these things that I identified with that were like reminders, like talisman of, of um, who I am and what I do and, and the elements of me that, you know, that just immediately reminded me. And, and again... I don't suggest that your safe space be filled with, you know, stripper poles or kegerators or or things that might not be that healthy. But, you know, I I think if we can build a safe zone with things that agree with our values and align with what it is that we want to improve about ourselves, um, then that's awesome. And maybe that's what we do. Like, uh, uh, just as an example, I just thought of my 18-year-old daughter is at college with no car. And one of the things she said is, you know, I really miss my car. And I thought she meant because she could, like, go places and stuff. But she's like, I like to be in my car by myself and listen to music really loud and just have an emotional moment with music. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's your safe zone. And, you know, she's a little bit like me, so I understand that. I I don't know that everybody needs this. I think extroverted people probably get this by going out and hanging out with a lot of people, and that recharges their batteries. But I think for the the more, you know, at least who knows how many, I don't know what the percentages are, but the people who are more introverted or have that, you know, especially if you're older um, and maybe have forgotten about the things you did about, the way you built your identity when you were younger, and maybe people don't suffer with this at all. You know, I have friends that are musically inclined and they play music all the time. I have friends that are into animals and they have a whole, you know, farm full of animals and they spend time with them. Maybe that's their terabithia. I'm sure there, maybe you're an athlete and you have your sport or you're a runner and that's your terabithia. But maybe, you know, if you're not those things and it's not super obvious what you need to do, uh, maybe you can carve out a little bit of space or and or time uh, for yourself and reconnect with uh, a former version of yourself that maybe had shit figured out. And I think that's one of the mistakes that I'm super guilty of on this journey of personal growth and self-improvement or enlightenment or whatever it is, is I always assume that I can do better than I used to do. But in this case, I looked at this 13-year-old kid and I was envious and I was I had admiration And I was like, this kid solved a problem. He felt unsafe in the world, and he invented an overall healthy, creative, inspirational space to compensate for that, which ended up 
being a wonderful thing that I long for today. And I wish, I hope that every human um, gets to experience. So for what that's worth, I hope that you have safety in your life and you have your own terabithia. And if you don't, there are people out there that can help you and, uh, you know, watch more of my podcast and I'll go through, uh, in future episodes, some of the ways that I sort of figured some of this stuff out. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate your time. You know, fo- follow me if you want to get a weekly email to remind you of these things. But uh, I got new episodes every Friday. Currently, there's going to be one or two regular knowledge plus experience equals wisdom episodes uh, every couple weeks. And then every third week or so, I'll release one of the curiosity um, episodes. I got DJ Doran, leader in the LBGTQ community coming up, and uh, David McCraney. Uh, who has the podcast You Are Not So Smart and books and uh, all kinds of projects that are super cool coming out soon in the next month or so. And uh, don't forget to visit my website, www.chrisbercher.com. Leave me a note if you feel like it, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for your time, guys. Take it easy.